I will say I'm surprised the stage isn't being weighed down from all the big brains sitting next to me. Um, <laughs> I want to first get started with just a quick intro. I know I gave a little bit of an overview today, but if everyone can go around, say your name, maybe what you do at your core developer team and where you work. Yeah, sure. Should I start? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph Alchemy, and I am product manager at Figment. And at Figment, we recently joined like almost a year ago as a core dev team with the graph. And our focus has been uh, majorly on integrating new chains and working on the multi-chain vision. Hi, good to see you all. Uh, I'm Janis Pohlmann. I'm the CTO of Engine Node, uh, one of the founders of the Graph. Uh, built a lot of the software that is running on the network right now. Hey everybody, I'm Sam Green. I'm a co-founder and head of research at Semiotic Labs. Uh, Semiotic does cryptography and AI within the Graph. Hi, uh, I'm Uli. I'm uh, one of the founders of a group called The Guild. Um, we've been doing a lot of open source around GraphQL, and we've joined the Graph around six months ago uh, to help with basically everything GraphQL and also uh, developer toolings. And it's the first time in history of The Guild that everyone uh, is here in person. Uh, so thanks for oh. making it happen. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Chris Wessels, founder of GraphOps. Uh, we're the latest core development team, which was uh, announced today. We're thrilled to join. Thank you very much. Um, we have worked across a, a variety of areas, but to, to name a few, uh, protocol econ, uh, indexer experience, and subgraph development. Amazing. So I want to set the stage a little bit and remind everyone that we have five working groups within the graph core development, um, indexer experience, protocol economics, snark force, protocol operations and, and, and network operations, and then data and APIs. Um, and I want to start actually with Yuri um, to speak a little more about you know, what you've been doing with the graph client and how that ties into these working groups. Yeah, so um, today we announced uh, the Graph Client 1.0, uh, finally. Um, so thanks for everyone who's been involved. Uh, all of the guild is sitting here, I mentioned. like It's the first time we all actually met in person after five years of working together. Um, and um, the idea, so when we joined the Graph about six months ago, we looked at like what is the developer experience uh, of people using the Graph uh, and using GraphQL with the Graph. Um, and the graph client, I think how we see the graph client is, you know, there was a lot of talk um, during the conference about, you know, all the amazing things that the graph and everything that everyone's building is doing. And I think for us, the graph client comes from the idea that doing the best thing should be the easiest. Um, so the graph client for us, it's not uh, just the best uh, way to interact with the graph. It's the best way to interact, to, to interact with GraphQL in general. Like we believe that uh, this release of the Graph client and also the next releases after that, even for let's say Web2 developers that use GraphQL, they should look at the Graph client. Uh, like we integrated a lot of ideas that we learned throughout all the years in GraphQL and throughout the six months with the Graph into this, let's call it a framework of basically using GraphQL in your applications. Um, so there's many things in it. I'm not going to dive into all the details now. But again, the idea is that this should be the best GraphQL client out there in general. It doesn't matter if you're a Web 2 or Web 3 developer. To a developer or a DAP developer that's fairly new to the graph, what would you say is the benefit of the graph client to their development experience? So um, there's many. I think, first of all, uh, a lot of when we started the, the graph client, working on the graph client, we basically interviewed a lot of uh, subgraph developers and, and DAP uh, developers. And we just saw the patterns that people keep doing manually. And we tried to put that into a framework. So for example, if you now want to query uh, multiple uh, subgraphs, now you can basically automatic, automatically with small configurations, uh, you can basically, uh, like basically mention all those different subgraphs and get one GraphQL, unified GraphQL API that runs on your client that calls all these different subgraphs. So that's where it started. Um, but then we saw more and more patterns, like you know, how people today do pagination, for example. Uh, so the, the framework actually now 
takes care of that for you automatically. So it does automatic pagination, automatic block tracking, like all kinds of different things we saw that people are doing again and again and again, and even saw in the graph docs, and we thought maybe this could be you know, automated um, by the framework. Uh, and there's many more things. Uh, yeah, awesome. I don't know how much time we yeah, have to talk no, that's about great. it. <laughs> Wanted to switch over to Chris. First of all, congratulations again on your grant. Really exciting. Um, I know your team is working closely with the core subgraph for the graph, but wanted to hear more about your vision for the team and, and GraphOps joining the mission. Sure, yeah. Um, I can say, you know, the, the team is absolutely thrilled uh, that we have this long-term strategic alignment with the graph ecosystem. I know we're all you know, enormously driven by the mission and values that the ecosystem is pushing forward. So we're, we're so excited to be scaling our impact. Um, I think it's, uh, it's worth talking maybe about two of the things that we'll be focusing on in the near term. Um, the first is trying to create orchestration and automation tooling for indexers um, that are Kubernetes-centric. Uh, and so generally, we believe that Kubernetes is the right platform that indexers should be targeting um, when they deploy their indexing operation uh, across whatever infrastructure that they leverage, whether that's public cloud or uh, private bare metal machines. Um, and today, the state of, of the graph stack on Kubernetes is, is OK. Certainly, some indexers run it that way. But we would like to make that the de facto choice for indexing, because um, we think that it is the right framework for indexers to reason about uh, their infrastructure. And it is far more amenable to the scaling requirements that we know are coming for indexers as the graph expands uh, across many blockchains. Um, and also, as the fire hose becomes more of a core component of the indexing stack. So that's certainly one area of focus that we think is important and will really facilitate the scaling of the indexing ecosystem. Um, the second that I will mention is our work on the gossip network. Um, and this is essentially going to be a mechanism that allows indexers to gossip directly with one another. And I guess I would um, put that in contrast to today, where effectively the protocol and the on-chain smart contracts effectively intermediate all of the coordination that happens between participants. Um, and so if I want to uh, you know, send a message that helps other uh, participants coordinate with me, I, I effectively need to do that on-chain. And the costs of doing so are obviously quite substantial. Um, and we hope that L2, and we know that L2 will lower that substantially. Um, but having the protocol intermediate all of those interactions um, somewhat creates like a, a floor for like the minimum value of a message or a signal that any participant would need to send to any other participant, right? It needs to be worth the gas. Um, and so by introducing a gossip network and allowing initially indexers, but we do think that this could scale quite nicely across other participants, too, um, to effectively gossip with one another over a P2P network. This really unlocks a new design space for coordination. Um, and I would say that that, uh, that doesn't replace the coordination that the protocol does today. I imagine that that would largely remain the same. But there are a lot of things that become possible when participants can coordinate at near zero cost which is you know, what uh, the, the Gossip Network will enable. Uh, and maybe just to, to, to give one example, um, today, uh, the way that indexers reconcile data integrity with other indexers, um, as I suggested before, is they have to look at what indexers have actually submitted on chain. Um, and that means that this process is somewhat backward looking, right? Because uh, you can only compare against POIs or data that has been posted on chain. Um, and so with the Gossip Network, indexers will be able to um, essentially come to real-time consensus uh, with other indexers what the canonical proof of indexing is for a given subgraph. Um, and that's great because it, you know, for example, allows an indexer to opt out of serving traffic the moment that they identify that their own 
data may have diverged from what the consensus is. Incredible, really looking forward to that. Um, as a segue, um, you mentioned proofs of indexing, and this is highly relevant to new chains and supporting multi-chain. Wanted to speak with Joseph here, um, learn a little more about your role and, and with Figment um, and, and what you guys have been working on in regards to multi-chain. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> sorry, I, I've drank too much coffee. So yeah, so us, Figment, as a Web3 company, we really believe in the multi-chain vision. And the reason behind it, like when you go to any new space or anything in real life, when you, when you want to look about technology or whatever is happening you're looking at, you always want to look at the people at the frontier who's pushing this frontier and you want to see like where, where they're headed. And when we looked at Web3 and we, we tried to make the same analogy in Web3, we start looking at the builders because the builders are the one who's pushing the frontier of Web3. And we're trying to look where, where are these builders going to and which frontier are, are they pushing towards. And it became natural to think about Web3, the natural evolution of Web3 is gonna be this pushing the frontiers to be multi-chain world. Because if we look at the builders right now, we can see that a lot of them are building a lot of applications or blockchain on different ecosystems. So if you're a builder, you know Solidity and you wanna like leverage the highest uh, security blockchain, you would build your applications on top of Ethereum. But if you want a different language, you want something that's more flexible, less transaction cost fees, you might, let's say, uh, go into Cosmos. And so when we start looking that the space is moving into this multi-chain uh, future, we start being a lot, as Web3 company, agnostic chain. So we, we believe in all chains. Every, everything has something to offer to the table. And then when we joined uh, the graph, that was our mission. Our mission was that we want to take this precious technology, like the awesome technology that everyone loves to use, and we want to start integrating with other chains and push the boundaries of, of the graph to keep up with this natural evolution of Web3. And the reason why also we did it is that um, when, when we think about like what we're really doing here is that we want to empower these people who's pushing the frontier of Web3, which are the builders. And when we talk to the builders, a lot of them are building like many cool, awesome applications, but their main problem is how they're going to get the data out of the blockchain. And so a lot of them are wasting their talent, wasting their effort, trying to build indexers, trying to run nodes, and it's not working for them. They're wasting resources to figure it out. And so they're losing a lot of advantage in the space. Some of them are using centralized um, data services. And us, like as everyone here, we believe in decentralization and we want to push the limits of decentralization as well. So I think it's our duty to bring this decentralized indexing and querying protocol to all these builders. So if we identify builders in many different chains building and they are using a centralized service, it's our job and our duty to bring decentralization to them. And so that's what we've been trying to do. And the first network we started with is Cosmos. And nine months ago, we announced that we're going to be integrating Cosmos. So we started researching Cosmos. And Cosmos is like a really innovative ISO idea. Like the way it works in the Cosmos ecosystem, you have the tendermint, which is the consensus and the networking layer. And everyone could just come and use it. Everyone could just come and use it to build applications on top of it. And so when we start researching it, we, we wanted to know like how could the graph make the most impact. And so instead of starting integrating the application layers, we went all the way down and we integrated Tendermint. So we can have all the applications layered built on top of Tendermint easily and rapidly enough. And I'm so excited today to share the news that uh, we finally completed the integration of Cosmos Hub network. <laughs> And now all the Cosmos developers, they can use the graph to get their decentralized blockchain data using the graph. And thanks to the beautiful team that we have over here, to your efforts, to our partnerships with Edge and Note, Yanis, and Streaming Pass, we made this possible. Oh, and one more announcement. Five minutes ago or something like that, we released the Osmosis GIP, and we have a better version of the integration of Osmosis. Wow, amazing. Really excited to hear. I would say Cosmos has been one of the more, more requested chains. Um, wanted to flip it over to Giannis and, and hear a little more about the GraphNode team and what you've been doing to improve indexing performance. This is one of the things the dApps look out for the most. Um, and you know, Substreams was mentioned, but we'd love to hear a little more about that and how that impacts dApp developers. Yeah, I'm going to try not to spill the beans too much um, because we have Sebastian's talk uh, still coming up in, I think, a couple of hours. Um, was meant to be earlier, but he, uh, yeah, he missed uh, one of his planes. Um, so yeah, the GraphNode team has been working on a number of performance improvements. Um, I do so like that goes all the way to making uh, making changes to Postgres itself and trying to upstream um, index. Um, so like database index performance improvements. 
uh, into Postgres, which um, would be pretty huge. Um, I think we have reached sort of uh, the limits of what sequential processing can, can provide in terms of performance, um, which is why the whole, uh, you know, part of the reason why we're having the substreams conversation, why substreams have been worked on. Um, and the key to kind of pushing beyond that and not just you know, achieving incremental performance improvements uh, like we have been uh, the last few years, uh, I think is to parallelize processing a lot. Um, and this is part of what, what Substreams is about. It's about uh, parallelizing uh, transformations um, that don't have data dependencies, um, whereas in subgraphs, um, unless users draw specific boundaries uh, for data dependencies, which they currently can't do, um, it's hard to do anything in parallel. Um, and substreams, yeah, the, the parallel processing is one aspect. Um, composition at indexing time is something uh, we've wanted to do in, in graph node and subgraphs uh, for a while. Um, but uh, kind of the flexibility and modularity of substreams uh, make that a little easier. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more. Um, uh, the Essentially, yeah, substreams do allow um, use cases that are not currently uh, possible with uh, the GraphKit API that that graph node uh, is providing. Um, I mean, it's, GraphKit is very well suited for, you know, web user, uh, web applications, mobile applications, um, less so for analytics use cases um, or consuming uh, subgraph data in, uh, yeah, in, in and kind of pulling it into other databases. Um, usually requires kind of scraping, and paginating through data in subgraphs, which a lot of teams are doing. Uh, that's not fun um, and not very efficient. Um, so yeah, we'll prove a, a lot on that. Um, yeah. Amazing. And kind of on, on the same track, you know, one of the, the components of, of the network and in improving indexing performance is verifiability. Um, so I wanted to pass it on to Sam. Hear a little more about, you know, what is the SNARK force? What, what is the path to verifiability? And also, you know, why of all problems did you guys choose to solve the graphs verifiability problems? Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. So the, uh, the SNARK force is a team uh, that is uh, it's composed of cryptographers that are at edge of node and cryptographers and crypt, uh, cri a cryptographic engineer at Semiotic. And so this team works uh, very closely together and has for the, the past year. And uh, I, should, I should give credit uh, that uh, the, the, the seed of all of these uh, cryptographic efforts were started three years ago at Edge of Node, which was previously called the Graph. Um, and so this has been, this work that is basically being um, unveiled today by, by Zach uh, is, is three years in the making. Um, yeah, so what this team uh, is doing is uh, they had to, they, these guys basically had to pre comb the previous literature and all the previous available solutions for, uh, for techniques for uh, uh, zero knowledge proofs and verifiable computing. And there were no techniques that satisfied all of the needs of the graph. And then they basically had to come up, of course, building on top of existing techniques, they had to come up with new techniques. And so this team has moved the state of the art forward in that, in that process. And um, so our goals with the SNARK force are to remove all trust requirements, all requirements for credible neutrality within the graph. And we want cryptographic proof, we want cryptographic security for everything we do within the protocol. We don't want any, any uh, you may not have heard this word today, but you, we don't want any human arbitration when there are problems uh, with, with uh, various participants in the protocol. We want everything to be provable on chain, and it needs to be provable efficiently on chain. And that's what SNARKs uh, let, us, let us do. Uh, and I guess one of the big things that, uh, that we're going to get out of verifiable queries is it's going, to unlock, uh, it's going to unlock other applications for Ethereum itself, like uh, EIP 44s. Uh, this is the uh, history expiry problem. This will let it. Uh, this will make it possible for people to run full nodes without having to have SSDs that can have that can be 10 plus terabytes uh, in size. It will allow people to run full. Okay, so full nodes are the things that actually are providing security within Ethereum. And how can we get rid of this requirement? Well, uh, with, this, with this state expiry problem, it can let the graph potentially be used 
for uh, users to uh, query historical data, which is currently done by full nodes. Um, and so, yeah, so our work for verifiable queries could lead to a solution for Ethereum itself. And the question of why, why are we working on this? So uh, if you look across the SNARK team, there are people that have been, in our team, there, have been, there are people who have been working on cryptography for 25 years, and there are people who have been working on cryptography for one year across the team. And so if you look way back in the past, it was actually cryptography that enabled e-commerce in the original internet. And there was this original explosion, and then there was an uh, explosion of advancements in cryptography. And uh, over time, those advancements got matured and they became commodity ideas. And currently, uh, ZK Snarks, we, we're currently experiencing another explosion, which is being motivated by uh, the need for offloading computing from the EVM to a verifiable uh, method uh, like what Snarks provide. And this is, gonna, this is going to give us this, we, we don't really know how, it's gonna be huge, I think, just like e-commerce was huge, and we're gonna see something else huge starting within the graph from these techniques. Amazing. So it sounds like you all work on very different things, and yet we're all the same team, we're all working on the same protocol. So maybe to, to all of you, what is it like working on such a multidisciplinary team across five working groups that are quite different? I mean, I can say from <laughs> our side, um, we kind of like took, we were like, we just, call, in our own private uh, Slack, we just called ourselves like, the web two boomers around here. Um, like, um, and, and the thing is where like we came from like, you know, maintaining and building a lot of tools for the web two world and then came here. And for us actually like this transition, not, not only that like we learned so much, uh, but also I think in order to improve a lot of things uh, in the graph, we actually took it back to let's say the GraphQL protocol itself. And we, we are now using like um, a lot of ideas and a lot of needs that we have in the graph uh, to basically push forward things in the GraphQL spec, in the GraphQL infrastructure, um, you know, like defer, stream, live queries, all kinds of real time stuff. Um, so I think it's, it's huge for us. And for us also, you know, if we're looking at the graph client, like the idea that um, we can have a client that could be shared and could be the same methods of building an app, whether it is a Web 2 app, a Web 3 app, and even like a, let's say, a hybrid app, right? Like some of the, the, uh, uh, the graph client is basically be based on Mesh, which is, I just want to mention one person, the only one person from the guild that couldn't come here, but a lot of the demos, a lot of the announcements today were thanks to his very hard work. It's Arda from Turkey. Uh, and you couldn't come here for visa. Yeah. Um, so I think um, for us, it's been just like, I think we're kind of like building here the gateway drug um, for a lot of like web to even existing applications uh, and existing developers to very easily move into web three and also for Web3 developers to very easily, let's say, integrate Web2 APIs just to kind of like bring on more and more use cases to gradually move people in, so, yeah. Can I, can I add something? Yeah. Um, so to me, kind of this extension of the original team um, with the core devs um, is kind of a necessity. Uh, if you think about the, the number of developers that have worked on, for instance, Graph Node, like all the indexing, um, talking about five, six uh, engineers, and a, a team that small cannot have kind of the the the, the broad kind of expertise um, that uh, that the core devs are providing. Like you've heard it in the in the overview that Eva gave earlier, um, that every team brings kind of their own superpowers, um, their own expertise, areas of expertise um, that um, we all had. Like the, the original team had like a part of this here and there. Like we had GraphQL experience, obviously. It's why the Graph is called the graph and why it uses GraphQL. <laughs> um, but uh, we don't have like the, the level of experience that the guild has, for instance. We don't have the level of cryptography experience and, um, and AI experience that, that Semiotic have. And um, you know, not the multi-blockchain experience. The graph has been uh, Ethereum only for a long time. Uh, well, it hasn't been for a while, um, thanks to the, the work that you've been doing and um, the work that uh, Streaming Fast has been doing. Um, so I think it's a necessity um, and it's very, 
very good. Together, we can achieve a lot more than we, we, than we could uh, with Edge and Node, even if Edge and Node were to grow uh, the engineering team. I think it's good and refreshing to have these different perspectives um, yeah, added into the mix. Now, another layer of this is not only that there's multiple teams, but we're building in public. Yeah. Um, so maybe, Johannes, to come back to you, do you want to share a bit more about what your experience has been as, as, as we've built more in public? Yeah, I mean, obviously brings its own challenges, um, you know, especially in terms of governance and coordination. Um, to me personally, I mean, for me, kind of working in the open is a very personal thing. Uh, I've been, been doing open source for almost 20 years now, um, since like 20, uh, 2004 or something. Um, and whenever I didn't, I wasn't happy. <laughs> so uh, to me, like working in the open, working on software that other people can contribute to, can, you know, inspect, um, is is just very very important, kind of ingrained in in my personality, and, and um, you know very very much got, got a lot to do with my with, with the values I have, um, and yeah, so that's that's to me that's really important. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd like to add something. It, it it touches on the prior question as well, and I I just want to say something about the culture of the graph. Um, because I think that is so seminal to this being possible. Um, and in, in great companies, you tend to see a culture where the best idea wins. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Um, you know, the intern could bring the game-changing idea to a giant tech org, and the culture of that organization will allow that idea to flourish. Um, and I think that what we're having, what we're seeing here is that on a scale, you know, much beyond any single company. Um, and without that culture, what we see here would not be possible. Um, so that, that, that's one really amazing thing about working in this environment. And I think you also have this cross-pollination of ideas, right? And um, that is great for coming to the kind of best technical solution, which I, I feel is like a lot of what we've spoken about so far. But I think that, you know, we, across the core developer group, um, and, and, you know, the core developer group is certainly not the only contributors to the protocol. We have loads of independent contributors. And these are people that come from, you know, every continent on the planet. Um, and the perspectives, the life experiences, the, relationships that these individuals have with their governments, their institutions, they help perhaps less in a technical context, but they're enormously valuable in a product context. Because ultimately, we're building products for people. Um, and I think that's, yeah, just, just something that's really struck me working in the ecosystem. Such a broad diversity of personal experience really brings um, something special to our prioritization processes and what we decide to build. That's a really great point. Yeah, yeah. if I may jump, jump in. And <clears throat> for me, just to provide like a different angle, it's very challenging and very innovative. Like it's something that you really want to look at from like, uh, from like cross perspective. Like I, I think a lot of people here today are building their own startups and they want to scale their own startups. And like as you start hiring a lot of people, you start having multiple departments, and the challenge becomes a lot like how would you, how should the marketing team uh, talk and prioritize with the sales team, with the product team, with the engineering team? And you start seeing a lot of this type of communications that becomes like one of the biggest challenge as for you to scale your own startup. But in startups, it's easy because like it all falls, uh, falls under one leadership. You have like our leaders, the execs, they are thinking, they are giving us like an objectives, roadmaps, we can make it uh, we can make it work. But like imagine an open source world where like you have five different companies or six different companies and we all we want to work together in a decentralized way in a dis on a decentralized roadmap, like the amount of communications and like we have to do on organizations for, for us to be able to pull this up, it's gonna be a lot. And what's gonna differentiate, differentiate like one core devs ecosystem from another is if they actually can be brought up by something that brings everyone together, which is the, the protocol that they are working on. Like in startups, if they have like a like weak mission, the startup is gonna fall unless like they really have something that they look forward to. I think here it was so easy with all the other core devs is because we were looking at the graph and we know how much the graph is important for the entire ecosystem. And I think that brought the entire core devs together and it was easy actually to start working with all these great minds over here. 
So almost like the roadmap united all these teams. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know we've been pretty public and transparent about our roadmap, but it's also a little convoluted sometimes. So Sam, I'd love to hear from you. You know, What's one thing that you wish dApps or end users better understood about the roadmap? Um, and you know, some, some, something that's really impactful to them that maybe they're not grasping. I, I think on this topic, um, we're uh, starting to unify a lot of the uh, agent-based modeling methods that we've been working on the past year. And we're starting to release tools that have come out of these, these efforts. For example, uh, just this week, we released a tool for indexer allocation optimization. Um, this is going to make it easier for indexers to choose which subgraphs, subgraphs to uh, index in order to maximize their profits. And we also released a tool for indexers to, it's called Auto Agora. It's a tool for indexers to automatically adjust prices to be competitive in the market. And we see this is just this is the beginning of the no, of the tools that we're going to be releasing, and over the next year we're going to really uh, I think we're going to start releasing tools for all um, all participants in the graph to help them so that they can basically express what what their priorities are what what they need to these tools and some of these and then these tools can help them uh, automate things on their behalf. Sounds good. I want to switch gears just a little bit um, back to the announcement earlier today that the hosted service is sunsetting in Q1 2023. Very exciting. Um, and wanted to hear from Giannis. You know, this milestone is massive. You've been here since the hosted service started. What does this mean to you and what are you most excited about on this journey? It's been inevitable. Um, uh, I hope it doesn't come as a shock to anyone. Um, there's still, you know, a lot of months. Um, the hosted service will, will be there for you. Um, for us, and as part of our vision, it's always been um, a step in the process of what we've called um, progressive decentralization. Um, you know, the way we started is we wanted to provide first a standalone uh, indexing solution that would be flexible enough for anyone to use it with less effort than like building one from scratch. That's where Subgrass came from, that's where Graph Node, um, uh, that's how Graph Node was developed. Um, the hosted service was then um, the quickest way uh, to then get that to a, kind of a hosted experience where people wouldn't have to run their own infrastructure. You know, for consumers, for developers, much very, very similar to the network now, um, where they don't have to worry about the infrastructure themselves. Um, but it was never going to be the, the end game. Um, and so for me, it's a, it's a natural next step. I'm glad we're making it. Um, I think the, the team that's been running the hosted service um, has been amazing at keeping it up, and you've seen the numbers of um, kind of the, the traffic it's seen. Um, so I uh, would like to all uh, would like you all to um, give them a round of applause. Um, don't see they, where they are sitting at the moment. I see Leo over there. I'm not sure where David is. Uh, perhaps we can give them a round of applause. Um, yes, like I said, I'm, I'm also uh, glad that we're making this this next step of focusing entirely on the network. Um, uh, because that is the future and always was always meant to be. Um, and I think we're now in a good good place to um, yeah to to really um, move in that direction and and make the network the the main point of focus. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I'm really excited about uh, for the next next few months is uh, building out the network, kind of especially the the number of chains that the network supports. like we've seen the hosted service is supporting something like thirty four different chains right now, um, whereas the network supports Ethereum mainnet and that's it. Um, I'm yeah, very much looking forward to the team, uh, to the work that's already under underway, um, uh, which will enable indexing rewards for uh, other chains. Um, and then uh, that will enable, you know, that will incentivize indexers to support subgraphs for these other chains as well. Um, and then we'll slowly move things over from the hosted service, provide more and more networks, um, more and more chains on the network. Uh, that's something really looking forward to. Yeah, really incredible, you know, that we're finally at the point of, of adding new chains. I know, Joseph, this is very close to your heart. Um, you know, wh what advice maybe can you share with indexers who not only need to now run Ethereum mainnet to support the network, but will now start to run that of different chains and they'll even choose which chains they, they want to run. So an anything you could share? Um, yeah, so, I would say like one of the most things when, when you want to start supporting like new networks, familiarize yourself with these ecosystems. 
So let's say like right now we're going to be integrating Cosmos uh, Hub chain and Next Osmosis and maybe like other few chains in the Cosmos ecosystem. So like if you were already someone building indexers and developer in this ecosystem, it's going to be easier for you to start building it. But if not, and you're interested, like I really suggest that first you start familiarizing yourself with the entire ecosystem, the mission, see if, if that's something that you would love to be part of or not. It, it aligns with your objectives, principles, and all these type of things. And then we, on our side, we're going to be like when we're integrating new chains, we're going to do our best to create as much uh, possible as uh, the mat learning materials. So like as, as an indexer, you want to be in this new system, expect from us that we're going to be sharing a lot of learning material. And one, I think the most important advice is don't be shy, reach out. You, there's a lot of people ready to help. And we're going to be really, like I think uh, today, announcement from Masari that they're going to be building subgraphs. And that's going to be something huge. So every time we integrate a chain, now we have at least someone who's going to be building Subgrass for it and, and creating the schema and set the right way. So reach out to them, reach out to the core devs, and let's build this stuff together. Amazing. What's, what's great is that we now have sort of a, a repeated and uh, well, a repeatedly proven process mm -hmm. for adding support for new chains that are not EVM, for instance. Um, and now it's just a question of yeah, enabling the, the rewards to have the incentivization in place um, for, these network, for these chains to be supported on the network. And then just need to do that work repeatedly to support these new chains um, in general. Now, a big part of this, of supporting new chains and indexing performance, is Firehose. We don't have the Streaming Fast team here, but Chris, I'm looking at you. I know that GraphOps has been getting dirty with <laughs> Firehose. would love to hear from you a little more about Firehose, maybe for the group that doesn't know, and what you think the impact is of Firehose on sunsetting the hosted service. Sure, yeah. I, first of all, really all credit due to the Streaming Fast team. Uh, honestly, I think they deserve a round of applause. They've done incredible work. Um, I think, yeah, you know, particularly uh, channeling Alex from Streaming Fast, I could probably talk about Firehose all day, so I've got to try and keep it short. Um, I think for me, uh, something that really stands out about the Firehose um, is, I, I guess I kind of see it as like the application of the modular blockchain thesis to the problem in some respects, in the sense that if you look at how indexing works today, for each subgraph that you add, for each subgraph that you index, you add some amount of load uh, onto the blockchain node that you're pulling the data out of uh, in order to index the subgraph. Um, and so this creates this kind of relationship where the more subgraphs you want to index, the greater the load that you exert on your blockchain nodes. And that compromises their ability to stay in sync. Um, and we, we see this problem uh, being particularly bad for high throughput chains. Um, and so uh, what the Firehose does is effectively, uh, when the blockchain node is operating, it streams uh, all of the changes that are happening uh, to the blockchain state um, out of the node and into this separate system called the Firehose. Um, and what's great about this is it effectively creates a constant load, a constant kind of workload for the blockchain node to essentially export all of the data and state about that network out of the node. Um, and that effectively decouples these two things, right? You have the blockchain node that continues to talk to the other peers in the network, and stay in sync and move forward with the chain. Um, and then you have this other separate layer, the Firehose, um, which is effectively your interface for streaming data about that chain out into downstream applications like GraphNode and Substreams. Um, so that, that, I mean, that, that alone, I think, is a pretty big deal and kind of goes to the modularization of the stack. Um, but the, I guess the architecture of the Firehose and, and the um, flat files based approach also unlocks a lot of advantages. Um, I, I guess maybe just touching on three, um, although again, could be here all day. Um, first of all, uh, whereas today, graph node and, and generally workloads that are attempting to pull information out of the blockchain, they effectively have this request response lifecycle via RPC. Um, so I have to ask a question, I get back a response, and then I can ask the next question. Um, whereas with the Firehose, data can actually be pushed proactively 
from its source, the chain, and then through Firehose, directly into downstream applications. Um, and you can imagine that that is great for, for efficiency and performance. So although it's early days and there's still a lot of work being done on that. Um, the second thing is that uh, because of the way Firehose is designed, it's possible to parallelize the workloads that sit on top of it um, to a massive degree, to an extent that isn't really possible with the approach today. Um, and for, for processing or reprocessing historical data, that is a game changer and is really at the core of, of that 100x speed up that was mentioned earlier today. Um, the third thing, well, I gotta pick one. Um, I think the third thing that is, is super interesting um, is that because we've moved all of the data uh, into its own layer, right? We've done that, we've executed that decoupling um, and all of that data is fully deterministic. Um, it's possible to share that data between participants and in this case, indexers. So. Um, what we will see in the future is the ability for new indexers to rapidly bootstrap their own operations by synchronizing the flat files underlying the firehose from other indexers. Um, and so just in terms of the ability for indexers to get up to speed with new chains or data sets, uh, this is a real game changer. Thank you for that thorough explanation. <laughs> um, we have time for one more question, and I think this is for all. But I want to start off with Yuri, because you are the Web2 boomer on stage. <laughs> and <laughs> sunsetting the hosted service is really the, the final you know, match for us with Web2. Um, and and, and I, I want to know everyone's vision you know, for how do we actually get more of Web2 developers into Web3? What does that process look like? And maybe, Yuri, you can go first. Yeah, I think it's related to what I said at the beginning. I think um, for us, you know, we came in and uh, we looked, first of all, from both sides. We started, like, first of all, uh, contributing to the graph node itself and exploring the code base and exploring the API. And then looking, when we started into graph client, we, we did what we usually do, which is just interviewing developers. In, uh, and we interview, you know, Web2 developers and Web3 developers. And I think what we came to realize is that the best way to make people use a new thing that, and, and use the right thing, let's say the, the decentralized network, is to make it just easier and better for them. You know, it's like, not because it's, you know, not it's because it's good for the society or anything like that, but because it's just better. Um, and I think, you know, you asked, one of your previous questions was, um, you know, what would you wish everyone to know about the roadmap and everything? I think we're, in some ways, we're already there. Like in some ways today, we're getting into the point where it's easier if you want to start an app uh, with all the tools that you know, we annou were announced today, like it might be already in some cases easier to start doing a decentralized app using all these tools uh, than you know, setting up the regular hosted uh, web two uh, services. So, we are for sure very excited about everything and it has to do with everything that was being talked about here. Also the way that all of the teams here are working together. Like we are part of many um, foundations, the Linux foundations, the GraphQL foundations, many other others and the way that things progress here and collaborate here and like someone said, I think you said like the best idea wins. Uh, I think that's what brought us here. So uh, yeah. I'm going to quote you on that one, so that it's easier now to build a DAP with the graph than without the graph. And, and also, if not, like, talk to us. Like, that's why we're all here. Like, uh, we're just waiting for feedback. And I think, um, you know, just on the graph client, every feedback that we got just in the last month, two, two, two months, we integrated into the framework. Um, so try it out and just, you know, everything that was being revealed here and just let us know how could we do better? Because for sure we can, but we also can execute on that. So, yeah. Joseph, your vision to get more Web2 devs in? Yeah, sure. So I guess, as a lot of us know here in Web3, incentives shapes behavior. So I think 
we, I think like something interesting is the more we are creating incentives for Web2 developers to move into Web3, the more we are getting out of them. And so I think we at Figment, at some point we launched something called Figment Learned. And Figment Learn was actually free tutorials, free courses for developers to start learning how to build in Web3. And we started seeing the big migration of Web2 developers into Web3. And that also was coupled with, with incentives. And I think like uh, we, the grants, like the total grants was something around half million dollars, like in total that was given to developers. And it's not just about incentives, it's like something that are attracting Web2 developers and we're telling them, hey, just learn and you're gonna get a reward for learning. And this small reward might be, you know, an opportunity for you to start building something, you have like small funding. And then at the end, it's about the community when they get, when they start asking questions and they get involved in the communities. This is where they start meeting other people and they start like realizing how interesting this space is. Like something a lot that I do, like when I go to Web3 conferences, meetups, and when we do some interviews, I talk to a lot of people and ask them, how did you get into Web3? And I was shocked that a lot of them got in because of like financial reasons, like they were buying Bitcoin or Ether back at the days, and they're like, oh, that's like something interesting, I wanna buy it to just like, I don't know, like they thought the token's gonna go up. And once they start learning about it, they start realizing it's not about just the token or about the price, there's something much bigger behind it, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's almost the same idea or the same vision with developers. Maybe they are coming for the incentives to start learning, to start building, but soon enough they are realizing that what's behind is just like much, much, much bigger than what they saw at the beginning. Absolutely. Giannis, any thoughts? Yeah, I would, I would split it up in sort of consumers and developers. Um, so from a consumer perspective, I think both, both cases, like uh, Uri said, in both cases you need to provide something that's better. Better can mean a lot of, lot of different things for different people. Uh, some people may care about privacy, some people may care about censorship resistance, um, uh, openness, um, collaboration, um, and like we've seen a good example with GEO, where um, collaboration around like global information, um, uh, you know, factual information that's, that's, um, that's curated together and is, is more, you know, is, is true rather than from questionable sources that are hard to trace back to, to anything. Um, I think that's that's one aspect. Provide applications that that people need um, that provide that offer something that the traditional web doesn't offer. Censorship resistance, for instance. Um, for developers, I think it's yeah. I think a lot has to do with okay, what do I need to to build what I want to build? Um, and sure, it's it's definitely easier. I think if you don't need to spin up, you know, find. Familiarize yourself with like a cloud provider. Learn how to write a server, you know, application. Um, host that somewhere. Learn how to scale it. All of these things um, become unnecessary um, through the graph, especially. Um, so I think that's that's a big leap already. Um, but I think there's more. Um, I don't think it's easier to write like a smart contract compared to mm -hmm. um, writing uh, necessarily um, compared to writing like a simple JavaScript application, for instance. But um, yeah, uh, I think I think we're getting there, step by step. Sam. Yeah. yeah so in my opinion, I think we need to continue what we're doing. Um, the uh, the snark force is going to be. So I'm going to be coming at this question from a research and development perspective. Mm -hmm. Snark force is going to be publishing multiple papers, academic uh, peer-reviewed cryptography papers in the coming year. Uh, in the AI work. As far as I know, we in the graph protocol have released the first reinforcement learning agent in Web3. If anybody knows different, please let me know. But these are these are pretty big, pretty big deals. And um, I'm starting to see some, I think that we're gonna be attracting uh, a lot of top talent. Uh, I've had, I'm having people cold, cold contact me that are in, in like in Web2 or in industry, people that you know went to MIT, Oxford, TU Darmstadt, people from these that are like doing these great things that are in more traditional roles right now and the stuff that we're doing the we're really we're really pushing the limits of these technologies we're working on not not just in the not just the AI and R&D but just the whole the whole way we're building it we're really pushing the limits and that's going to attract top talent and you know just speaking from the semiotics perspective we're getting top talent coming to us just saying hey can you it's my Really, what I want to do is Web three plus AI, mm -hmm. and we're going to get we're going to get some of these people, and then then we're going to also we're, we'll be able to be in a better position to attract really good engineers that want to also 
see these R and D ideas uh, instantiated mm -hmm. in real, you know, in, in real systems. So I think we just need to keep keep doing what we're doing. And Let's definitely poach all those people. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, to end it off. Sure. Um, I certainly want to echo everything that's been said so far. I definitely agree. Um, I think another major driver will be um, business efficiencies. And I think for me, a lot of what Web3 is about is less about the technology and more about the business models that the technology unlock. Um, and I think it is, I think DeFi is a particularly great example of this where you know, we see that uh, you know, companies like Uniswap who you know, have, relatively speaking, small teams um, are rivaling you know, companies like Coinbase with respect to the utility that they provide to customers, the volumes that they facilitate. Um, and I think they're countless examples, right? Like the, today on Ethereum, the cost of deploying a new index fund, right, a, an ETF equivalent, is 100, 1,000 X lower than what you would need to spend in order to achieve this in a more traditional setting. And I think there are countless examples where the technology unlocks fundamentally more efficient business models. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that will be a lot of what drives developers, because they will follow the business opportunity um, and you know, the ability for Web3 native businesses to compete is very strong. Yeah, I would echo that. You know, what really takes it home for me as a non-developer is, you know, we should not have DAP developers focusing on their back end. Um, really, they should focus on their core competencies, building good products, front end development, and let the hard stuff be taken care of by a network. Any final comments before we head off? Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and please round of applause for all our core devs. Thank you. Yeah.